Thank you very much to our esteemed speakers. This concludes the formal opening part of our evening. Now, the Nuremberg Academy Lecture. The Academy launched this lecture series in 2020, marking the 70th anniversary of the formulation of the Nuremberg Principles. The Nuremberg Academy Lectures explore topical issues at the intersections of international criminal law, transitional justice, and policy. Through its public lecture series, the Academy invites speakers of national and international renown, scholars and practitioners to discuss topics of contemporary importance and importantly, to promote the public understanding of international criminal law. In the inaugural lecture, um, entitled International Justice and Personal Stories, Professor Philippe Sands discussed the origins of international criminal law and provided us with a glimpse in light of the 75th anniversary of the opening of the International Military Tribunal. Following the pandemic, it is now our distinct pleasure to be once again here assembled in courtroom 600 in person, and we have heard already how the spirit of Nuremberg lives on and how the legacy of Nuremberg is truly palpable in this very special place. The breadth and depth of expertise and experience gathered here in this room is truly remarkable, and it is truly a pleasure and a privilege to be in such distinguished company. Once again, thank you for being with us here today. I turn now to our main guest of this evening, Professor Klaus Kress. I'm truly delighted that you immediately accepted our invitation. Your one hour lecture will be followed by brief remarks from Katja Coyle, Minister of State of the Federal Foreign Office of Germany, who is able to be with us this evening. And then there will be a moderated discussion, and if there is time, we'll be taking questions from the audience. Professor Kress, <clears throat> Professor Kress will deliver his lecture on the Ukraine war and the crime of aggression. I think it is hard to think of anyone more qualified to do so, and we are tremendously honored that you accepted the invitation to come here. I think as the special advisor to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court on the crime of aggression and such a prolific author um, on the topics, it is truly um, a delight and a special treat to have you here. You hold the chair of German and International Criminal Law and is the director of the Institute of International Peace and Security Law at Cologne University. His publications comprise more than 200 articles and pieces on the law on the use of the force, the law of armed conflicts, and international criminal law. His practice prior in the German Federal Ministry of Justice on matters of criminal and international law, and served as a member of Germany's delegation to the ICC negotiations from 1998 to 2017 as part of the delegations. In 2019, he was appointed judge ad hoc at the International Court of Justice in the case of the application of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, the Gambia versus Myanmar. He, of course, holds numerous academic and personal honors and accolades that I will not be able to run through today, but it is a true pleasure to explicitly mention that he has been a long-time friend and supporter of the Nuremberg Academy, for which we are truly, truly grateful. So please join me in welcoming Professor Klaus Kress. We very much look forward to your lecture. Thank you very much, Viviane, for this kind introduction. Madam State Minister, Mr. Lord Mayor, Mr. State Secretary, Excellencies, in particular, the Ambassador Korinevich from Ukraine, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, in and outside courtroom 600, Dear friends, and not least, dear Klaus Rakwitz. It is a special privilege to speak about the crime of aggression at the very place where the all-important precedent on crimes against peace was set. I very much thank the Nuremberg Academy for showing me this honor. I also congratulate the Academy for having chosen this topic for tonight's lecture. 
As a result of Russia's aggression against Ukraine, the future of the international legal architecture regarding the crime of aggression figures prominently on the international legal policy agenda. Governments will decide about the way forward, but those decisions should be informed by prior public debate. The Nuremberg Academy is ideally suited to provide a forum for such a debate. If we look back to roughly a century of international public debate about our topic, one discussant stands out for his dedication and his moral authority. This discussant is Benjamin Ferenc. Ben has left us a little while ago, but his powerful inspiration will stay with us. I have certainly felt that way when I worked on the manuscript for tonight. I dedicate this Nuremberg lecture to Ben's memory. My starting points should not be controversial. In 2014, in Crimea, the Russian Federation began to violate at a minimum, the prohibition of the use of force to the detriment of Ukraine. On 24 February 2022, Russia escalated its course of action into a full-scale war of aggression. Russia's ongoing conduct against Ukraine thus constitutes an act of aggression, which by its character Gravity and scale constitutes a manifest violation of the Charter of the United Nations. Hereby, Russia's conduct fulfills the state conduct element of the international consensus definition of the crime of aggression enshrined in Article 8 bis of the ICC statute. Hence, President Putin and some other members of the Russian leadership are under suspicion of having committed the crime of aggression. Yet, the International Criminal Court cannot presently exercise its jurisdiction over this crime. Such an exercise of jurisdiction would require the UN Security Council to refer the situation of Ukraine to the ICC. But at long, but as long as Putin holds power, Russia would subject such a draft resolution to the same kind of abusive veto as it did with the Council's draft resolution of February last year condemning Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Should we worry about that state of affairs? Some believe that we should not or at least that there are many far more significant things to worry about. They think that we should be content that the ICC can exercise its jurisdiction in Ukraine over genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Judge Schomburg, to name one, has called the present situation regarding the crime of aggression a, I quote, luxury problem, end of quote. Together with the President of Ukraine and the Ukrainians, I respectfully beg to differ. In my view, rather than a luxury problem, Russia's aggression against Ukraine has shown a light on a glaring gap in the existing international legal architecture. Nuremberg is the perfect place to make this point. Yet, I wish to emphasize right away that I'm not making the point out of Nuremberg nostalgia. In particular, the statement in the Nuremberg judgment that waging a crime of aggression is the supreme international crime is not the premise of my argument. My view is not that the crime of aggression is necessarily more important than genocide crimes against humanity or war crimes committed on a systematic scale. Already for this reason, I am not belittling for a moment the enormous significance of the ongoing ICC investigation 
led by Prosecutor Khan, which has recently resulted in an arrest warrant of historic importance against President Putin. But at the same time, I do believe that the crime of aggression is no less significant than the other crimes, and that there may be occasions where it is crucial to prosecute the crime of aggression. Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine is such an occasion. This is so for the following reasons. Certainly, the war of aggression against Ukraine violates that state's sovereignty and territorial integrity, as well as the right of self-determination of the Ukrainian people. And certainly, Russia's war of aggression has opened the floodgate for the commission of horrendous war crimes. But crucially, the legal wrong entailed in Russia's aggression does not end there. It includes all the damage to fundamental rights of Ukrainians, which Russia has caused without violating the international law of armed conflict. The international law of armed conflict for humanitarian reasons provides not only the soldiers of the victim state, but also the soldiers fighting on the side of the aggressor with the liberty to kill enemy combatants. The aggressor is also at liberty under the law of armed conflict to accept the possibility of unavoidable, non-excessive civilian deaths or injuries as a result of attacks directed against military objects. Countless losses of such kind have been inflicted upon Ukrainians by the Russian aggressor, and none of those are war crimes, crimes against humanity or genocide. Only by prosecuting the crime of aggression can Russia's leadership be held criminally responsible for that vast part of the war's violence. This point is so important that I wish to make it also in general terms. Here I build on one of the most thoughtful texts that have been written on the subject. Frédéric Maigret's essay entitled, What is the Specific Evil of Aggression? Maigret reminds us of the basic fact that for humanitarian reasons, the law on the conduct of hostilities launders a very significant part of the violence in war. This means, and here I quote Maigret, that war represents a monstrous exception to the notion that all human beings have an inalienable right to life, security, bodily and psychological integrity, freedom of movement, etc. The crime of aggression and only the crime of aggression ensures the individual criminal responsibility of the leadership of the aggressor state for opening the floodgate for this monstrous exception. For this reason, it is deeply misleading to divide the four crimes under international law into three atrocity crimes on the one hand and the crime of aggression on the other. To the contrary, the crime of aggression is as much an atrocity crime as the other international crimes. The prohibition of aggression does not only protect the rather abstract value of state sovereignty, it also protects very concrete, fundamental human rights of potentially countless human beings who may suffer and die in a war of aggression. All this is under threat when the international legal prohibition of aggression is at risk of erosion. This is why a negative precedent regarding the prosecution of the crime of aggression after Russia's aggression against Ukraine, rather than being a luxury problem, would be fundamentally detrimental to the international legal order. Robert Jackson, the US chief prosecutor at Nuremberg, had identified the danger of norm erosion after Germany's wars of aggression in all clarity. Hence, Jackson saw the acute need to activate 
what we would today call the expressive function of international criminal law. Here, in this room, Jackson made an historic promise. And President Zelensky has reminded the world of this promise just today in The Hague. This is what Jackson had to say. I quote, the ultimate step in avoiding periodic wars, which are inevitable in a system of international lawlessness, is to make statesmen responsible to law. And let me make clear that while this is first applied against German aggressors, the law includes, and if it is to serve a useful purpose, it must condemn aggression by other nations, including those which sit here now in judgment. End of quote. The pronouncement of this Nuremberg promise constitutes a shining moment of true United States leadership in international criminal justice. And please remember that the Soviet Union had emphatically chosen to sit in judgment in Nuremberg too. Jackson's promise remains at the core of Nuremberg's legacy. In view of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, it should resonate more loudly and strongly than ever since the entry into force of the UN Charter. The question is then, how has it come that despite this powerful Nuremberg legacy on crimes against peace, we are left today with a glaring gap in the international legal architecture concerning the crime of aggression. Or, to borrow again Maigret's words, why has aggression experienced a decline from the leading and central crime at Nuremberg and Tokyo to one that only barely made it into the Rome Statute? One important reason is that the prohibition of the use of force soon turned out to be surrounded by a gray area of genuine legal uncertainty, which is reflective of deep-seated policy differences among states. This made it a real challenge to generalize the precedence of Nuremberg and Tokyo. But another part of the truth is this. The governments of those nations that sat in judgment in Nuremberg have in the meantime turned away from the daunting task of delivering on their Nuremberg promise. As Yale historian Samuel Moyne has recently written about the United States in his important book, Humane, I quote, we fight war crimes, but we have forgotten the crime of war. When it comes to the question of independent legal scrutiny of the decision to use military force, not only the Soviet Union and now Russia, but also the three Western powers that sat in judgment in Nuremberg have adopted a position of resistance that Gary Simpson has aptly called sovereigntist. Ben Ferenc has described this sovereigntist mindset in the following way. I quote, the vital ingredient that was really lacking was the political will of a few major powers that persisted in their refusal to accept rational international controls over the use of military force. End of quote. In the course of the negotiations, this lack of political will was mostly veiled by legal arguments. The two most important arguments neither of which convincing were to allege a Security Council monopoly over the initiation of proceedings for the crime of aggression and to treat the crime of aggression like a new crime in the ICC statute for the purposes of setting out the conditions for the ICC's exercise of jurisdiction over it. As the Coalition for International Criminal Justice recalled in a statement of last week, the majority of state parties from Africa, Latin America, and Europe opposed this position. Nevertheless, 
the Kampala conference ultimately gave way to the debilitating conditions regarding the crime of aggression, although they were undoubtedly understood as being driven by self-interest of larger powers." End of quote. The sidelining of the crime of aggression by the major powers during the ICC negotiations was significantly facilitated by the posture that an important part of the international human rights movement had long taken regarding the question of war. By and large, this movement had abdicated vis-a-vis -vis the use in Bello and accepted the idea that the killing by an aggressor during the conduct of hostilities is no violation of human rights and not the business of human rights organizations if in conformity with the permissive rules of the law of international armed conflict. In addition, organizations with a moral authority as important as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch had, a, had adopted a policy not to comment on the conformity of military action with the use contra bellum. Instead of fully recognizing that aggression opens the floodgate to a monstrous exception to fundamental human rights, irrespective of the commission of war crimes, the international human rights movement had come to see aggression primarily as an offense against state sovereignty as such. This has paved the way for a mindset that scholars would later conceptualize through a notion of atrocity crime that embraces genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes, but excludes the crime of aggression. When international criminal justice experienced its revival in the 1990s, this approach took a firm hold in much of the non-governmental discourse community. And this had tangible consequences. While civil society played a decisive role in the creation of the Rome Statute, the same society did not exert sufficient public pressure to remind the major powers of Jackson's Nuremberg promise. Rather, as William Shabers has observed, many of the non-governmental organizations were, I quote, quite indifferent to the issue of the crime of aggression, end of quote. And in the meantime, France, Great Britain, and the US had happily embraced the concept of atrocity crime as a most welcome rhetorical device to continue sidelining the crime of aggression. As a result, even after 17 July 2018, when the ICC's jurisdiction of the crime of aggression got activated, the prevailing concern with respect to war was with its humanization rather than with its outlawry. Here are five examples that reflect this persistently prevailing mindset. In 2019, Turkey conducted its massive military operation Peace Spring in Syria. Although there was a very serious possibility that this use of force fulfilled the state conduct element of the crime of aggression, this crime was not a salient issue in the discourse among governments. Second, in 2021, that is three years after the activation of the ICC's jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, the European Union chose to simply ignore that crime on the day of international criminal justice. High Representative Borrell stated as follows, I quote, every 17th of July, we commemorate the historic adoption of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court in 1998 as an important moment to reflect on the importance of fighting impunity and bringing justice to the victims of the most serious crimes, genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Full stop. Third, in May 2022, the European Union adopted an amendment of its regulation on Eurojust 
This amendment extended Eurojust's scope of action with respect to genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. The crime of aggression, however, was left out. Left out still at this moment in time. Fourth, in August 2022, the International Law Commission adopted, on first reading its draft articles on immunity of state officials from foreign criminal jurisdiction. Correctly, draft article 7 denies functional immunity in proceedings for genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. The crime of aggression, however, has, left, has been left out. Against the vigorous opposition, by the way, of the distinguished African Commission members, Charles Jello and Dire Tladi. And fifth, most governments, apart from Ukraine, kept silent about the crime of aggression throughout the lead up to 24 February 2022, as well as for months thereafter. In view of all this, it was difficult, even in the summer of 2022, to disagree with Maigret's assessment that, I quote, aggression belongs to, but is hanging by a threat in the firmament of international offenses, end of quote. In the meantime, however, there are numerous indications that the picture may have begun to change. Already in 2018, the UN Human Rights Committee had laid an important doctrinal ground for such a change. In its General Comment 36, it stated, I quote, state parties engaged in acts of aggression as defined in international law, resulting in deprivation of life, violate ipso facto Article 6, that is the right to life, of the covenant. The significance of this statement can hardly be overstated. Hereby, the Human Rights Committee has rightly claimed a space for the human rights conscience to address by its own distinct normative voice all the war violence inflicted by an aggressor state. After 24 February 2022, Philip Sands was the first to raise the issue of the crime of aggression in public. Why not create a dedicated international criminal tribunal to investigate Putin and his acolytes for the crime of aggression, he asked. And he recalled, after all, it was a Soviet jurist, Aaron Trinin, who did much of the legwork to bring crimes against peace into international law. Let Putin reap the legacy of Nuremberg, so Professor Sands concluded. His call resonated powerfully with the victims of Russia's aggression and was immediately taken up by the head of Ukraine's diplomacy. After all, as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Kyiv, Dmitro Kuleba, now Ukraine's Minister of Foreign Affairs, who is an international lawyer, had written a paper on the Declaration of St. James of January 2, 1942, a catalyst for Nuremberg. Leading voices of Ukraine's civil society soon lent their emphatic support. Among them, Oleksandra Matvichuk from the Center for Civil Liberties, one of the recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize. Soon thereafter, parliamentarians worldwide began to raise their voices. One parliamentary assembly after the other, including parliamentarians for global action, addressed the issue of the crime of aggression. The culmination point of this series of public pronouncement was Resolution 2482 of the Council of Europe's Parliamentary Assembly. This impressive resolution, adopted by unanimity, 
demands that the Russian and Belarusian political and military leaders concerned, I quote, should be identified and prosecuted for the crime of aggression, end of quote. The Assembly cited General Common 36 of the UN Human Rights Committee and stated as follows, I quote, without their decision to wage this war of aggression against Ukraine, the atrocities that flow from it, as well as all the destruction, death and damage resulting from lawful acts of war would not have occurred. The United Nations Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine also included an important reference to the crime of aggression in its report of March 2023. Now, there also seems to be a growing interest in ensuring accountability for the crime of aggression within the NGO coalition for the ICC. By way of example, I just mentioned the very active participation of the Open Society Justice Initiative in the ongoing debate. All this taken together indicates a shift in world public opinion in the direction of a renewed determination to live up to Nuremberg's legacy on crimes against peace. The, I quote, new momentum, as Prosecutor Kahn has called it, was powerful enough to spill over to the governmental level. Liechtenstein and the Baltic states took the lead, and then more and more governments took up the issue of the crime of aggression. In November last year, the UN General Assembly for the first time explicitly mentioned the activation of the ICC's jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. One month later, the European Council declared that the prosecution of the crime of aggression is of concern to the international community as a whole. In February this year, the European Council followed up and endorsed the setting up of the International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression against Ukraine. And in March, the US has added its voice to the growing chorus. In an address delivered in Washington, Ambassador Beth van Schaak recalled the United States, I quote, leading role in prosecuting the crime of aggression at Nuremberg. She recognized, I quote, a critical moment in history. And she confirmed, I quote, there are compelling reasons for why the crime of aggression must be prosecuted. With the US appearance on the public scene, it has become abundantly clear that the new momentum concerning the crime of aggression has had an effect on the posture even of some of those governments that had for decades adopted a position of sovereigntist resistance. But one key question remains. Are we witnessing a genuine change of position? One that genuinely embraces Jackson's call for a consistent non-selective application of the Nuremberg precedent on crimes against peace. With this question in mind, let's now turn to the options available to close the accountability gap regarding the crime of aggression. As a matter of principle, the best option would be to amend the ICC statute, as proposed, for example, by Prosecutor Khan. The ICC, the only permanent international criminal court and one with a credible universal orientation, is the most legitimate judicial institution to deliver on Nuremberg's fundamental promise. Yet, as Astrid Reisinger Corazzini has recently shown, the necessary reform of the ICC statute raises a number of legal 
and policy issues which cannot be decided overnight. For that reason, decision makers do not see an amendment of the ICC statute as a practicable solution to the immediate challenge, the war of aggression against Ukraine. This is understandable, but it should go without saying that it is no justification for delaying the necessary diplomatic process in support of reforming the ICC statute for the future. I shall return to the latter point, but let's first look at the other options concerning the ongoing war of aggression against Ukraine. By now, 36 states have joined the so-called core group in support of Ukraine's call for the establishment of a special tribunal on the crime of aggression. Before turning to the question of institutional design, I wish to address two arguments which challenge the very idea of a special tribunal. The first argument is that a special tribunal could weaken the ICC. I respectfully beg to differ. The ICC would continue to carry out its important work with respect to allegations of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. A special tribunal would do no more than to complement this work with respect to the crime of aggression. The special tribunal would serve precisely the same overarching goal as the ICC, that is to ensure the most comprehensive accountability possible for crimes under international law. Experienced practitioners have long suggested ways, such as the establishment of a liaison office, to allow the ICC and the special tribunal to coordinate and to thereby create useful synergies instead of causing friction. One could even explicitly recognize the primacy of the ICC's exercise of jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis the special tribunal. Again, the ICC is the most important pillar of the existing global system for the prosecution of crimes under international law. But the work of the ICC will invariably need to be complemented by additional judicial activity. Which kind of additional activity will differ from situation to situation? As judges Higgins, Koymans, and Burgenthal wrote in their memorable separate opinion they appended to the ICJ's 2002 judgment in the arrest warrants case, I quote, the international consensus that the perpetrators of international crimes should not go unpunished is being advanced by a flexible strategy in which newly established international criminal tribunals, treaty obligations, and national courts all have their part to play." End of quote. The second counter-argument is that proceedings before a special tribunal for the situation of Ukraine would constitute selective justice. This argument is central. Selectivity in international criminal justice constitutes a burden for its legitimacy. By all means, selectivity must therefore be reduced. With respect to the special tribunal, the argument of selectivity has been made with respect both to the past and to the future. It carries far lesser weight with respect to the past. Yes, and most regrettably, there were a number of serious violations of the prohibition of the use of force in the past where investigations for crimes of aggression would have been warranted. I name Iraq's use of force against Kuwait in 1990, Uganda's use of force against the Democratic Republic of Congo as from September 1998, 
the use of force by the United States and United Kingdom led coalition of the willing against Iraq in 2003. And Turkey's use of force in Syria in 2019. Yet, at every historic turning point in the evolution of international criminal justice so far, decision makers were faced with past failures. Had those failures of the past posed an insurmountable obstacle to taking action for the future, there would have been neither Nuremberg and Tokyo, nor the ICTY and the ICTR, nor the ICC. Failures of the past with respect to the crime of aggression should therefore not prevent us from doing the right thing today for the future. And even less so in view of Russia's aggression against Ukraine, which, taking all relevant factors together, constitutes a violation of the prohibition of the use of force of unprecedented seriousness. The issue of selectivity weighs heavily, however, if one looks to the future. Today, Russia's leadership benefits from jurisdictional constraints that have resulted not only from its own, but also from the sovereigntist resistance of three major Western powers to a principled jurisdictional regime in the ICC statute. This begs the following question. Could it be that the creation of a special tribunal for the war of aggression against Ukraine is meant by those powers to remain an event as isolated as Nuremberg and Tokyo has remained to date? This is the most burning question of legitimacy. But asking this burning question should not be the end of the matter. It should rather embolden decision makers to show true leadership. They should conceive the special tribunal as a necessary but imperfect instrument of transition, as a stepping stone towards a genuine embrace of Nuremberg's promise through a more principled jurisdictional regime in the ICC statute. Such an effect would certainly not be without precedent. Just remember how the ICTY and the ICTR, both special international criminal tribunals, helped preparing the ground for the ICC's jurisdiction over genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Germany's Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock publicly recognized the need for principled action in her important speech delivered at the Hague Academy of International Law in January this year. Minister Baerbock was as sensitive to the question of selectivity in international criminal justice as one should be. But she did not therefore rule out a special tribunal for the war of aggression against Ukraine. Instead, she suggested that the establishment of such a tribunal should be the first track of a strategy of two. The second and more time-consuming time track would have to be, she said, the amendment of the ICC statute with respect to the crime of aggression. I wholeheartedly agree. Now to the right format for the special tribunal. Just a few weeks ago, the foreign ministers of the G7 have come forward in favor of an internationalized Ukrainian tribunal. We support, they said, the creation of an internationalized tribunal based in Ukraine's judicial system. End of quote. Almost at the same time, 13 European and non-European states issued a joint statement in favor of an international tribunal. 
This is in line with the unanimous call of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. To begin with, none of the two formats is inherently superior over the other. The choice must be made in light of the circumstances and needs of the given situation. In her Washington address, Ambassador van Schaak has given essentially two reasons why the US favors a tribunal based in Ukraine's judicial system. She said that such a court would provide the, I quote, clearest path to establishing a new tribunal, maximizing our chances of achieving meaningful accountability, end of quote. I am not convinced by either of these arguments. In fact, both of them I find rather astonishing. First of all, creating an internationalized tribunal in Ukraine's legal system is by no means the clearest path available. To the contrary, it remains unclear to date what precisely should be the international elements of a Ukrainian tribunal. The only thing that is reasonably clear is that the internationalization of a Ukrainian tribunal would have to be meaningful. Otherwise, such a tribunal would become an all too easy target of charges of politization. But precisely the meaningful internationalization of a Ukrainian tribunal would require Ukraine to change its constitution. Even if somehow practicable, despite the imposition of martial law, this approach would cost a lot of precious time in a situation where time is of the essence. This is one reason why Ukraine disfavors the option of an internationalized Ukrainian tribunal. It is rather odd to speak of a clearest path under such circumstances. But would an internationalized Ukrainian tribunal at least maximize the chances for meaningful accountability? This is also not the case. Accountability will be the more meaningful, both for the Ukrainians and for the defense of the essence of the international legal order, the more comprehensively it reaches up to those allegedly most responsible. But to put it cautiously, the chances that the judges will pierce the veil of personal immunities with respect to President Putin and other members of the Russian Troika will be far greater before an international tribunal than before an internationalized Ukrainian tribunal. With the ICC's arrest warrant against President Putin, this should have become abundantly clear to everyone. What is worse, the International Law Commission's deplorable exclusion of the crime of aggression from the list of crimes in draft Article 7 of its immunity project has created the risk that judges of a tribunal based in Ukraine's legal system could feel compelled to grant functional immunity. This would reduce the chances for meaningful accountability to zero. But the immunity challenge is not even the most serious problem associated with an internationalized Ukrainian tribunal. Please do recall the warning mentioned earlier that the crime of aggression, because of its distinct history, today only hangs by a threat in the firmament of international crimes. Hence, at this historic juncture, the strongest possible message is needed to confirm that the crime of aggression is an international crime. 
an international crime as much as genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes. An international crime in the prosecution of which the international community as a whole does not take a lesser interest than in that of the other three crimes under international law. The establishment of an internationalized Ukrainian tribunal would fail to send out this message. The institutional design would not clearly convey the international character of the crime of aggression and would emphasize Ukraine's national interest as the immediate victim rather than that of the international community as a whole. To heed Ukraine's call for the establishment of a truly international tribunal for the crime of aggression would be a most welcome deference to Ukraine's democratic choice as powerfully restrained by its president just today. But it would be far more than that. It would also be the most plausible way to translate into institutional design what also the G7 themselves have explicitly recognized, that proceedings for the crime of aggression are in the interest of the international community as a whole. The preferable path to establish a truly international tribunal has been laid out in all clarity. The tribunal would be set up on the basis of an agreement between the UN and Ukraine, negotiated for the UN by its Secretary General and at the request of the General Assembly. Is there a compelling argument against pursuing this path, despite the advantages of an international solution that I have just mentioned? Doubts have been expressed about the power of the General Assembly to get involved. These doubts are, however, ill-founded. In its 1962 advisory opinion in certain expenses, in particular, the International Court of Justice has elaborated on the functions and powers confirmed on the General Assembly to exercise its secondary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. The court explicitly recognized that those functions and powers are not confined to the making of recommendations and they are not merely auditory. The court found that only coercive action is within the exclusive realm of the Security Council. But the request to the Secretary General to conclude an agreement with the state on the establishment of an international tribunal for the exercise of jurisdiction over crimes under international law does not involve coercive action. This was confirmed by no lesser body than the Security Council itself in the case of the Special Court for Sierra Leone. For in that case, the Council acted under Chapter 6 rather than Chapter 7 when it requested the Secretary General to conclude the relevant agreement with Sierra Leone to establish a special international criminal tribunal exercising jurisdiction over crimes under international law. Are we perhaps again confronted with the old strategy that a lack of political will is clouded behind a veil of legal doubt. Please recall how differently it sounded here in Nuremberg in 1946 when the president in question did involve a strong element of novelty. Then Sir Hartley Shawcross, the British chief prosecutor, confidently exclaimed, I quote, if this be an innovation, it is an innovation which we are prepared to defend and justify." End of quote. The second argument against an international tribunal refers to an alleged skepticism in the global south. Because of this skepticism, so the argument goes, the necessary majority in the General Assembly is unlikely. 
at first sight, this argument sounds benign because it indicates a concern for the position of states belonging to the global south. But suspicion sets in when this argument is advanced by major powers from the global north, and this before a serious and sincere engagement with the global south on the issue has taken place. I am certainly not in a position to speak for anybody in the global south. I just wish to recall four points. First, states from the global south were driving forces for the inclusion of the crime of aggression in the ICC statute in Rome. And an overwhelming majority of states from the global south supported the activation of the ICC's jurisdiction of the crime of aggression on the basis of stronger and more principled jurisdictional rules in Kampala. Second, on 23 February this year, 141 UN member states recognized the need to ensure accountability for the most serious crimes under international law committed on the territory of Ukraine. Third, among the 13 states that have issued a joint statement in support of an international criminal tribunal, there are three states from the global south. And fourth, eminent personalities from the global south, such as former UN General Secretary Ban Ki-moon, former ICC President Ebo Osuchi, and Chief Prosecutor Richard Goldstone, do support the establishment of an international tribunal. Can it be that the negative speculations regarding the Global South's position are designed to preempt a serious and sincere engagement with the states concerned. After all, those who have started to reach out in good faith to states from the Global South have not heard outright rejection. They do hear, however, the question that not only the Global South, that all of us should ask, the burning question about consistency and non-selectivity. I submit that an engagement with the Global South in earnest about the establishment of a special international tribunal is absolutely worth pursuing. But it requires a credible answer to the one question how those who now plead for the establishment of such a tribunal for the war of aggression against Ukraine intend to deal with a similar aggression in the future. Those 13 states that have issued the joint statement in support of the establishment of a special international criminal tribunal have given the right answer. They have reaffirmed, I quote, their commitment to harmonize the jurisdiction of the Rome Statute over its four crimes in order to allow the International Criminal Court to prosecute the crime of aggression in similar future situations." End of quote. The same commitment by the G7 is conspicuously missing. This suggests that France, Great Britain and the US have not yet left their comfort zone. Their comfort zone of sovereignist resistance against a principal jurisdictional regime for the crime of aggression in the ICC statute. What would it take for those states to make that decisive move? It would certainly mean a renewed commitment to the prohibition of the use of force one which should involve abstaining in the future from an unlawful invasion such as that in 2003 in Iraq. But it would not require to refrain from the use of force wherever its legality is genuinely controversial. 
the international consensus definition in Article 8 bis of the ICC statute is as modest as the definition of a crime under international law should be. It avoids overambition and accepts the undeniable fact that the prohibition of the use of force is surrounded by a gray area of genuine legal uncertainty, one which is reflective of long-standing and deep-seating policy differences among states. Accordingly, the wording and the travaux preparatoire of Article 8 bis of the ICC statute and a due regard to the underlying customary international law require the prosecutor and the judges to keep clear from that gray area. To give a watertight guarantee beforehand that the prosecutor and the judges will in fact respect the modesty of Article 8 bis of the ICC statute is impossible. This is why leaving the comfort zone of sovereigntist resistance above all requires the investment of a measure of trust. A measure of trust in the international judiciary. Is it too much to ask for such an investment in the interest of the establishment of a principled international legal architecture against aggression? I don't think so. All the more because I agree with Ambassador Beth van Schaak. We are at a critical moment in history. In one of his last writings, Ben Ferenc mentioned that he had taken inspiration from Thomas Paine, saying that the duty of a patriot is not to follow his country right or wrong, but to uphold it when it was right and to try to correct it when it has gone astray. In this spirit, I wish to end this Nuremberg lecture with a plea to my government. Such an end note seems all the more fitting as State Minister Coyle is giving us the honor of her presence tonight. I certainly recognize how precious G7 solidarity is, but it should not be the last word where important principles of international criminal justice are at stake. I therefore wish to encourage Germany's government to do the following. To recognize the merits and the feasibility of a special international tribunal for the crime of aggression. And to join forces with a group of 13 to sincerely and seriously explore this option with states from all world regions on the basis of the firmly declared intent not to stop there, but to also become a leading force with a view to harmonizing the jurisdictional regime for all four crimes in the ICC statute. This would not even require a major change of position, for Germany has already embraced the Nuremberg promise on crimes against peace. As an important lesson from its own wars of aggression. Ben Ferenc's friendship with Germany's ICC delegations and with the late Judge Hans-Peter Kaul in particular grew on this basis. I'm therefore hopeful that Ben agrees with my end note. How sad none of us can get his advice on our manuscripts, this one included. I thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dick Klaus, for this wonderfully engaging lecture with your usual eloquence and powerful delivery. I think you gave us a lot of food for thought and one which will be taking up some of the issues in a rich discussion which I'm sure will follow. Before we get into the discussion of the most important issues, <clears throat> We have the privilege that Minister of State Katja Coyle is with us here today. It's a true treat to have you with us. And um, allow me to briefly introduce our speaker. A member of the German Bundestag since 2009, Katja Coyle served as Parliamentary Secretary of Allianz 90, the Greens, from 2009 to 2017. As legal spokesperson from 2013 to 2021, and as disarmament spokesperson from 2017 to 2021. She has served as Minister of State since 8 December 2021. We very much look forward to your remarks and then to a fruitful discussion thereafter. Thank you very much. Dear Professor Kress, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to attend this important lecture and event here in courtroom 600, the birthplace of modern international criminal law. And I applaud the Nuremberg Principal Academy and its new director, Professor Suffling, on devoting this year's academic lecture to an issue of the highest political and judicial reference, relevance, the accountability of states and the fight against impunity of state leaders especially for the crime of aggression. The significance of this issue cannot be overstated. Sadly, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine and its war of aggression show how important it is to promote and defend the UN Charter, the sovereignty of nations, and international law. Professor Kress, let me start by thanking you for your most interesting lecture you know how much I value our exchange and debate on these issues from our last meeting at the Federal Foreign Office in Berlin. We absolutely agree on the need for accountability for the crime of aggression, and this is our point of departure. There must be no impunity for the crime of aggression, neither in the current situation of Russia's war of aggression, nor in any other case, case, anywhere and at any time. If at this juncture the law of the strong were to prevail, then in the future a victory for justice will become ever less likely. That's why back in 2010 we campaigned in Kampala for the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court to be expanded. At that time, we managed to extend the ICC's jurisdiction, which had been limited to three crimes, to a fourth, namely the crime of aggression. This reform wasn't perfect. It was achieved through a difficult compromise, and its limitations are now becoming more apparent than ever. The lack of prosecution in cases such as Russia's attack on Ukraine is painful. That's why we are now pressing for a new attempt at reform to universalize ICC jurisdiction for the crime of aggression. Foreign Minister Baerbock made this clear in her speech at the Haag Academ Academy of International Law on January 16th. Reform of the statute will not be accomplished overnight, as we well know. Many countries are opposed to this also within the G7. However, we want to stay strongly engaged in efforts to expand the ICC's jurisdiction to include wars on aggression. The momentum we are witnessing due to Russia's outrageous attack on Ukraine must be seized to find a solution not only for this particular case, but to bring about a solution that is comprehensive. We are determined, excuse me, that said, we are aware of our own historic responsibility, as is clear not only since entering this courtroom, as well as of our responsibility as one of the 44 Kampala countries. In the future, it must be possible to investigate nationals of all countries for the crime of aggression. Irrespective 
of whether or not the aggressor have ratified the Rome Statute. The ability to prosecute crimes in connection with a war of aggression would then be based on the ratification of the statute by the state that is attacked and on a crime having been committed on its territory. However, this is and will remain a mandatory prerequisite for the ICC to have jurisdiction, even in the event that the statute is amended. That's why we are clearly pressing for the Rome Statute to be ratified by Ukraine itself. As we work to expand the legal basis within the framework of the agreements, we by no means intend to sit back and wait when it comes to the current case of Russia, Russian aggression. We are determined to use the existing legal basis to enable these criminal offenses to also be prosecuted to the fullest possible extent. We therefore support the idea of a special internationalized tribunal for the crime of aggression against Ukraine, the jurisdiction of which would be based on Ukrainian law. It would not be possible for third parties to call into question the legitimacy of such a court rooted in Ukrainian criminal law. In recent weeks, I have had a great number of exchanges on this issue, the most recent of which included US counterparts who support the idea of an internationalized court along with many other partners, most prominently the G7 countries. The fact that the United States, after a difficult national coordination process involving the State Department, the Pentagon, the Department of Justice, and the National Security Council, also supports a special internationalized tribunal is something of a mini Zeitenwende in terms of US policy. On April 18th of this year, the G7 foreign ministers and the high representative of the EU issued a communique expressing their common position on the most effective means to pursue accountability for the crime of aggression against Ukraine. They stated, we support exploring the creation of an internationalized tribunal based in Ukraine's judicial system to prosecute the crime of aggression against Ukraine. The authority of this court is to be strengthened by its international elements, its location outside the Ukraine, an international investigative authority and judiciary, international financial support, and endorsement by the United Nations in the form of a resolution of the General Assembly welcoming the establishment of the tribunal. In our view, such a court would also be in a position to bring charges for leadership crimes of aggression despite the functional immunity enjoyed by the Russian leadership. However, we do believe that the Troika is an exception because only the ICC, and this is another recent development in international law, would have the power to overcome its immunity. In the federal government's opinion, even the UN General Assembly does not have the authority to change this. By issuing resolutions, it can only provide political support for special courts. It is not, however, able to create a court's legal foundation and thereby establish its legitimacy. All special courts in the past derive their legitimacy either from UN Security Council's resolutions, example al-Bashir in Sudan, or with the consent of the state in question, as in Sierra Leone. Despite all of our collective misgivings about this limitation of the existing legal framework, there is, unfortunately, no shortcut to legitimacy. Finding a solution based on existing law will not only be less open to criticism, but can also not be suspected of challenging or even weakening the ICC. What's more, such a solution will underscore the need for comprehensive reform and the necessary empowerment of the ICC. Let me close here and thank you all once again for inviting me. 
Not only I'm passionate about academic exchange, I also highly value legal discussions as a profound and important tool when it comes to shaping new ideas and coming to assessments. I'm grateful to the Academy for organizing this second event within the Nuremberg Principal Academy Lecture Series. And of course, I want to thank everyone here in this historic courtroom for your interest. And now I'm looking forward to our discussion and to hearing questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much once again, Professor Klaus Kress and Minister of State Katja Koyl for this fascinating exchange. I think we've seen we've got quite a bit of common ground um, and also some points of contention, which I'm sure we'll delve into some of these pressing issues, which um, we hear so much about these days. I think at stake really are the discussions about institutional creation and the institutional design of a potential accountability mechanism. Um, and importantly, as both of you have raised this interplay of legality and legitimacy for such a tribunal, um, you know, to be able to have a sustainable imprint um, and actually deliver the kinds of justice that we're hoping for. Allow me to start directly with you, Klaus. Um, in terms of this interplay of legality and legitimacy at the core is this question of immunity. Um, and I think one that you've laid out very formidably for us. Um, to pierce this veil of immunity, um, what do you see as the key point or the key counter-argument um, that you would make in order to have, once again, this tribunal actually carry the weight forward and target the crime of aggression as precisely the leadership crime that it is often seen? Well, I'm happy to be obedient and take your question first, but I would um, like to immediately continue and ask a few questions then uh, to the Minister of State, but the immunity question was one that you touched upon, so why not start here? Um, distinguishing between personal uh, and functional immunities, you said that with respect to what is currently the preferred German, um, the model that also Germany prefers, you are quite confident that functional immunity will not be an obstacle. And I can only say I wholeheartedly share the hope. I would hasten to add, one could have done more, Germany included, to prepare a better ground for this um, hope, because currently there is this lacuna that I've mentioned in draft Article 7. I'm not saying that a potential Ukrainian internationalized tribunal should be impressed by what the ILC has done, but there is a risk uh, here that I think um, we cannot deny. Currently, as draft Article 7 is formulated, the crime of aggression in the view of the ILC does not seem to be a crime under international law where in national proceedings, and that's the core of your proposal, to base it in, in Ukraine's jurisdiction, uh, functional immunity is denied. So I'm just saying here, while I am of a different route, there is a risk. And speaking again about clearest path, most meaningful ways to accountability, I think risks should figure uh, in the equation. Then. Regarding the personal immunity side, you said that the current German position is that you accept that there is no personal immunity in Putin-like cases before the ICC, but then you say only the ICC. And this is a point, frankly, having thought long and I hope deeply about the issue of personal immunity, that I simply do not understand and I would like to ask you to, to give us an idea uh, what is the distinguishing rationale. Why should a special, in, and now I'm speaking of my preference, an international tribunal set up 
by a treaty, Ukraine, United Nations, and the whole process being initiated by the um, General Assembly, why should such a truly international tribunal, why should the judges sitting on the bench of such a tribunal decide differently from the ICC, from the Sierra Leone Tribunal, all these clear precedents um, which uh, are based on the international nature of the tribunal. So, and I, um, as you have heard, I have formulated it very cautiously, deliberately very cautiously. I have said the chances for meaningful accountability, including the Troika, are greater before an international tribunal. And this, I really, under current international, and I'm speaking about law now, current law, not future law, um, I think that's really difficult to deny. And most importantly, um, I simply find no rationale to distinguish between the ICC and another truly established international tribunal in that respect. And now my um, two questions, uh, both with respect to the special tribunal in response to your remarks. You, it, in one sentence, you said, well, uh, that you are less concerned about the legitimacy of a special tribunal if it's based on Ukrainian law. That seemed to be, I'm, I'm just checking whether I understood you correctly. I think when it comes to aggression charges, the risk that a tribunal based in national law, in the national system of a country, which happens to be the victim in such a situation, is, and that does not say anything about Ukraine's structures, uh, is almost obviously easier to be targeted for lack of neutrality, perception of a, a, a lack of impartiality. So this is why I fail to understand why you think that the legitimacy of a Ukraine-based tribunal would be stronger than a truly international one. I have not even made a wild climb, a claim about a, a national tribunal not being legitimate. I've not made this claim, but what I would confidently state that uh, an international tribunal properly set up representing directly, as Passioni would have said, the international community as a whole, how could one envisage that its legitimacy is weaker than that um, of a tribunal based in Ukraine's order? And then the third point, when you were expressing worries about the General Assembly's role, I wasn't quite clear whether your point was about legality or legitimacy here. My position is very clear as I put it forward, and it's not just my position, it is a position, for example, shared by the long-standing legal advisor um, of the United Nations, that such an establishment with the involvement of the General Assembly would be perfectly legal. That does not yet say anything by necessity about the immunity question. That's, a, analytically speaking, a different issue. But the position of, as I see it, the overwhelming majority of discussions does not challenge the legality of the possibility of the establishment of such a tribunal. And I was just wondering, um, is the German government among those who doubt that position, or is it only about legitimacy? that you worry, but you are not questioning the legality of the approach that I have suggested. So I would be many more fascinating questions, but I leave it, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, uh, I leave it there. <laughs> I guess I can for Okay, well, um, thank you for these uh, really um, little questions. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, let me start with, with what I think is the most important thing we talk about is the question of legitimacy. 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 So, And the difference between those two proposals that we are talking about is that 
What we plan to do is stay within the frame of the existing law, of based on Ukrainian law, do a prosecution that is not quest, cannot be questioned because it is possible on the base of the existing law. And the risk, the danger is, we are always willing to create something new like it's happened here. But creating new law, we need to be very sensitive that if we create something new, in order to be legitimate, it needs to be applied to all cases and not to one case. Because that would really weaken the legitimacy of a, of a case. And so in my view, that's, that's the most important thing. And when you look at it, for like, for example, from the global south, as you manage it, it, this is, it is a sensitive consensus that we cannot risk to lose because then we cannot repair it. So that's why it's putting in danger the consensus of the Kampala member states. And the ICC exists, and it makes, if, if, we, if we really have a consensus in changing it for all cases, as we both want, then we could do it. The reason why we don't do it is because there is no consensus. And this is, will be seen by the Global South. We do create a new law in a single case because we don't have the political power and we don't have the consensus to do it for everybody. And that's why I think the risk in taking that is higher than in saying we do what we can on the basis of the existing law and then we fight for our common political goal even though we know it's very hard but that's what I meant by saying there is no shortcut we need to go through this political process in order to have a credible um, result. And we're frustrated that we don't have that political consensus. We're both frustrated by it. But the hard it is, we, we have to go this long way. We cannot take a shortcut because then we delegitimize what we have, the compiler consensus and the treatment. So that, that is the most important point. And um, I, don't, I don't know if, if I understand right the, what you mean with legal or legitimacy, but I want to answer that. Um, I think what, what you're proposing is something that hasn't been done before because all the other cases, even Sierra Leone, is different from the war of aggression that we see now from, from Russia on Ukraine because the the court was created with consensus of the state of Sierra Leone, which of course here is, it, it's a different constellation. So I don't think it's the same. So saying we'll have a treaty between the UN, the Secretary General and Ukraine, and then a resolution of the um, UN um, Assembly is not the same. It's just hiding that we don't have a consensus in the Security Council and that we don't have a consensus among the members of Kampala. And so in the end I come to the result that the risk doing this is much higher because we can lose something we created that we cannot repair once the trust is gone because it's built on the, on the trust of those who want to apply and stay within the ICC. And how thin the eyes is, we already see by what's happening with the statements by South Africa, thinking, oh, leaving the ICC, staying with the ICC. So it just shows us how thin the eyes is, that the eyes is on which we move. Well, like. well, as I said, the immunity um, of the Troika is there. I don't think we can, as you said, with, but neither with uh, a court based on national, or on Ukrainian law, nor with an international court that's created newly. We cannot overcome the, uh, the immunity of the, of the Troika. Of course, all this is frustrating, especially since the person that you really want to prosecute will even be absent so there is no, right now we cannot uh, achieve what we want. But 
if we want to make sure that for the future we have a solid base to prosecute the crime of aggression in all cases, we need to be careful not to destroy what we have. Perhaps just to clarify for the audience where we disagree, in law, it seems, is that I am to an extent, as you, frustrated. I think we are both frustrated about the jurisdictional restraints in the ICC statute. There we perfectly agree, both in law and politics. I am less frustrated with the existing law than you when it comes both to immunities and to the powers of the General Assembly. Because to make that crystal clear again, my position, and the position of all those many proponents, Ukraine included, in favor of a truly international tribunal with a, a role in the process of the General Assembly. All those are not saying that they are proposing to create new law. They are saying, and again, I say it again because it's just such an authority and he knows the practice of the UN uh, for years. The, legal the former legal advisor of the United Nations has gone out in public saying it repeatedly, that he has no doubt whatsoever that this can be done under existing law. As you may recall, we had an expert hearing in our Foreign Relations Committee uh, in our Bundestag. Four public international lawyers were unanimous in their view that it is possible. One of them even said, certainly impossible. So just that not a wrong impression is created. I take it that you doubt this position, but I am under no doubt. I am saying it's not about creating new law, and therefore also your, your other argument that the idea is about uh, going away here that could not be repeated in the future. No, that's, that's not the position. Uh, the position that I have presented is because the, the General Assembly can do under existing law what is proposed to be done, that this could also, the same model theoretically, could also be applied in future cases. But here, as a matter of law, no problem under the law, but here we agree, I think, in the future we do not want such an ad hoc mechanism for another time. For the future, for all future situations, here again I think we are in entire uh, agreement we wish the better equipped institution, the ICC, to take care. So th this agreement is only about this transitional <coughs> step where you doubt the legal possibility of an international tribunal, um, which I am convinced exists. And that brings me to my, my last question, and this question um, concerns the area where we agree and I was extremely pleased to hear you again saying how determined you are to work on the ICC statute for the future. And of course we both know that it's difficult and that there is, for the reasons I have explained, reluctance by some. But I wonder, and I said there is no justific justification to delay the process. We all see there is not yet a proposal to move forward uh, on the agenda of the Assembly of States parties where such a proposal would be long. And placing <coughs> a proposal there would not yet mean agreement, but initiating a process. And so th this last, well, I can put it as a question or I can put it as my firm belief that really just because this process is so demanding and difficult, cannot be done overnight, requires consultations with everybody. Um, should one not, in the most promising diplomatic structures, forming a like-minded group, place, placing it on the agenda, begin with this process now, alongside the discussion about the ad hoc tribunal? These are two tracks, as Minister Baerbock has said. So my, my urging would be not to waste time because we seem to all agree that there is now a sentiment of a, an open window, of a new momentum like Prof, uh, Prosecutor Khan said. 
Um, so that would be, I, I don't put it as a question, but I put it as an appeal um, to really, if I may say so, speed up here. Okay, let, let, let me start again with that point where we don't agree or where you say I doubt whether the, uh, the General Assembly <laughs> is a possible and legitimate way to overcome um, the lack of um, possibilities in the Security Council. That's, that's the point where we are frustrated. We have that debate in, on other topics too, not only on the judicial, but then we have when it comes to uh, uh, what can we do when one member, one veto member of the Security Council is a, a member of the, if, is, a, is a conflict party. Can we somehow overcome that, that blocking of the Security Council by using the General Assembly? And we don't think that's possible because of how it has been created, how the UN Charter has put the difference between the Security Council and the General Assembly. We think it is not, again, to use the word, a shortcut. We have a problem, we have a political problem, and we cannot just go out on the way to find a shortcut in using the Assembly. This is, this is a point where we don't agree, and again, I would say, by doing this, it is not what has been conceived by the UN Charter, so it would be new law. We, could, we would think of it of something that hasn't happened before. There is no such thing. So this is exactly where we go, where we have a different opinion. And then the second thing you mentioned about the momentum, we shouldn't lose time, I absolutely agree. The momentum for a political consensus to changing the statute is now with the war of aggression on Ukraine is now there. What should happen to the momentum of dynamics if we create a solution for this case? What is going to, where, how do you want to keep the pressure and the momentum on our partners who refuse to change the Rome Statute. How do you want to keep the pressure on that debate if one time you have a, a special tribunal for the Russian war on Ukraine and then the pressure is gone and then nobody else will have the, the, the pressure to, to go ahead and, and change their, their, their political um, uh, opinion in the Kampala state. I mean, you know what I mean? It could even kind of stop the momentum that we need to use. So it is not about losing time. We don't want to lose time, exactly as you say. That's why we think while we're keeping up the pressure on the 44 Kampala states, we use what we have that is, cannot be put into question the, the existing Ukrainian law that we have to use to go ahead and do what we can while we fight for political consensus. Thank you very much. I think we've you know, dealt into some of the very important issues, some of the nuances and where the debate really becomes sophisticated and to be really clear in terms of what concepts um, we use. I think there's so much more which we would be able to discuss here, um, precisely about the prospects for alliance building, for support, um, for a particular model of justice, for what it precisely means, this meaningful internationalization, um, how severe these constitutional limitations that are often mentioned in terms of the Ukraine constitution actually are, and again, this um, question of legitimacy, right? Legitimacy for whom, in whose eyes, does it matter what the Ukrainians wish or favor, um, and how is that factored into the debate in terms of the long-term sustainability or effectiveness of any such tribunal? So there's a lot more I think we could delve into. Um, at this point, I'm um, looking at the clock, so I think um, perhaps if you would like to share a final thought um, in less than a minute, um, otherwise I think you've said all that you've wished to say um, and I think we'll continue our discussions 
and the margins um, outside. So allow me on this note to thank you for this fascinating exchange. I think we have a whole day ahead of us tomorrow at the Expert Symposium to delve into depth, and I'm sure it's such a vibrant and dynamic discussion on the policy level um, that we will continue to hear the arguments being fleshed out more and more. So allow me to come to the official thank yous of the evening. Thank you all for all of you for being with us, for bearing with us, and um, it's been a true honor to have you with us here today. Thank you, of course, to the Academy team for the hard work, dedication, and commitment to make this event possible. And of course, lastly, um, and most importantly, thank you to our main speaker, Professor Klaus Kress, and to Minister of State Katja Coyle for being with us this evening. It's been a fascinating exchange, and thank you very much once again for you. Don't worry, no closing remarks from my side. Just also a thank you from my side, Klaus, for your lecture of overwhelming brilliance. Knowing you, we expected, expected nothing else. Thank you, State Minister. Klaus gave you a hard time, but you survived. <laughs> and I thank you for that, for you know, standing up to that. Um, I think we've laid out the discussion points and the, the, the consent and the and, and where we don't, don't agree, so it's been a, a wonderful, a wonderful uh, layout in this moderation and discussion. Thank you, Viviane, for your guidance here in that regard. I can state now two things. First of all, the field is plowed for our expert symposium tomorrow, and second of all, you are desperate for a drink. So it's my great pleasure now to invite you to our reception just outside the door, where we can share a glass of wine, some Franconian specialities and continue the discussion on the crime of aggression, on the Nuremberg trials, or even some more uplifting topics. Um, we have, the Academy has prepared a book of condolence for Ben Ferenc. I will lay this here on the judge's bench. If you want to contribute and pay a reference uh, to Ben Ferenc, uh, feel free to come up to the uh, bench and uh, sign or write a few lines, whatever, whatever you want. But um, this is our uh, contribution to, to Ben Ferenc. Thank you again here on the judge's bench. Thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful evening at the International Nuremberg Principles Academy. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you.